PCB antennas are pretty common because they are small and cheap. Can we use them for our projects? How do they work? And how can we test and tune them? Let's look at an antenna for the 868 to 915 MHz ISM bands. As a side effect, you will learn how to measure impedances directly on a PCB. Hello wireless enthusiasts! Here is the channel with a strange Swiss distortion in the signal, with a new video around wireless and other exciting stuff. Make sure you subscribe if you do not want to miss the following emissions. The name of those antennas is inverted F or IFA because of their original shape. Its impedance is 50 ohms if done right. And because most of the modules we use are 50 ohms, we can connect it directly using a 50 ohms transmission line. To reduce the size, we can meander the resonator. Then the antenna is called MIFA. So in this video we will look at how these antennas are built, correctly set up a VNA for PCB work, test and trim such an antenna. And because I will use the newest light VNA, you also get a glimpse of it. Recently I got these boards from another Andreas, one of my viewers from Italy. It is a LoRa sensor module, designed for agriculture and consists of an Atmega 4808 MPU and an RFM95 LoRa module. Andreas created an antenna directly on the PCB. Its design is from this Texas Instruments design note. And he asked me to check if the antenna works, which we will do now. The antenna looks similar to the Wi-Fi antennas on our ESP32 modules, just larger. And as mentioned before, it is an inverted F antenna invented around 1958. These traces create a matching network for the 50 ohms feed point and this part is a lambda quarter resonator. No parts, traces or ground should interfere with this structure. This ground plane is part of the antenna, as we will later see. If you are interested, I leave a link in the description to a video that explains how this antenna works. Andreas placed the RFM95 module a little away from the antenna feed point. Therefore he had to create a 50 ohms strip line from the antenna pin to the feed point. And the design has provisions to add three matching components, which are not needed because the RFM95 has a 50 ohm output impedance. This is why he placed a 0 ohm resistor in this place and left the two others unpopulated. The next question was, is the antenna good? To answer this question, we have to know what that means. We can divide the system into parts. The transmitter, including the transmission line, the antenna and the far field pattern created by the antenna. The transmitter creates a defined power. The antenna radiates a big part of the power it gets at its feed point. How big this part is, is called the efficiency of the antenna. And it creates a field with a directional pattern. If your receiver is in a good area, it gets a lot of energy and if it is in a bad place, it gets a smaller field. Let's start with the transmitter up to the feed point. If impedances do not match, energy is reflected by this impedance change. The output impedance of the RFM95 is 50 ohms. If the impedance of the strip line as well as the antenna impedance at the feed point is 50 ohms, the total power goes into the antenna and can be radiated. If not, part of the power is reflected and is lost. So first we measure the impedance at the place where the RFM95 expects 50 ohms. Because we are on a budget, we use a nano VNA for this purpose. I use the newest iteration, the light VNA. It is faster than the old ones, has a bigger frequency range and a lower noise floor. And what I like a lot is, it shows the calibration range and not only a memory number. But we encounter the first problem. We have no SMA connector where we have to measure the impedance. How can we proceed? 
We just create a short coax cable with an SMA connector on one side and solder the other side to the pin and ground. But wait before you heat your soldering iron. First, we have to talk about calibration and the reference plane. All VNAs have to be calibrated before being used. Also the rig experts and alike. Calibration has two reasons. First, it has to compensate for inaccuracies of the instrument. And second, it defines the reference plane. Most rig expert users only are interested in SWR measurements and therefore always assume the reference plane is at the connector of the instrument. And they trust the factory calibration will stay accurate over many years. That is why they think calibration is not needed. We care a little more. Therefore, we calibrate the instrument for the frequency range we want to use. I choose a range from 700 to 1000 MHz and 400 measuring points, which creates a measuring point at every 0.75 MHz. The calibration is done as always with a short, an open and a load. Because we only want to measure S11, no through calibration is needed. I also use this simple SMA adapter as a connector saver. Like that, I do not have to pay too much attention when I mount my cables. I can dispose this adapter from time to time and the connector of my light VNA stays like new. Thank you, Alan, for your tip. After calibration, the reference plane is here. Do you spot the problem? We do not want to have the reference plane here. We need it on the PCB. What to do? We know from video 001 that we can shift the reverence plane a few centimeters by using the E-delay function. However, it might be called differently on your version of the Nano VNA. I found that my cable creates a delay of 700 picoseconds. Adding this delay shifts the reference plane to the end of the coax and we can solder the coax to the output pin of the RFM95 and ground. Now the reference plane is correct. Here is the first measurement. You see why I said that the ground plane is part of the antenna. The yellow curve shows the SWR. It should be close to 1 on 868 MHz. For sure, it has to be below 3 for an acceptable antenna. If I move the PCB away from the table, the curves start to move. Not only a bit, they move very much, particularly if I touch the PCB with my hand, even with my gloves. Not good. The best practice is to take your measurements with the board mounted in its final position and in its case, battery etc. attached. The material of the case also influences the antenna's impedance, by the way. At least we see that the resonance is close to the 50 ohms point in the middle of the display. Resonance is where the magenta phase curve is very steep, by the way. So the antenna matching is OK. An attached battery creates more stability, but reveals that the resonance frequency of the antenna is too low. Fortunately, because we can shorten the antenna, if it had been too high, we would have to extend it. So I cut the trace a bit and now the minimum is closer to 868 MHz. With these adjustments, we get maximum power into the antenna. The efficiency of the antenna cannot easily be measured, but generally it is more than 90% for this type. The last part of the antenna performance is its gain. As said before, the power inserted in the antenna will be emitted into the air. Here we have to watch two things, polarization and antenna gain. The polarization of this antenna is linear and the plane has the same direction as the PCB. The gain of an antenna is somehow misleading because it suggests we gain something. In reality, we only redistribute power from one direction into another. The inverted F antenna, for example, has such a pattern. It emits less power in these two directions and concentrates the power in these two directions. The redistribution is not significant. The same is true in the vertical axis. 
because we lose a lot of power if the receiving and the transmitting antenna have different polarizations, it is advisable to place the PCB of the sensor that it has the same polarization as the receiving antenna. So we got to know the simple MIFA antenna. It is a cheap solution because it can be manufactured together with the overall PCB. We also learned how to use a VNA to measure impedance and about the place where to measure. We also learned that these antennas react to their environment and that the ground plane is part of the antenna. We did not cover how to create 50 ohms strip lines on the PCBs. This is stuff for another video. That is all for today. As always, you find all the relevant links in the description. 73 to everybody. And please consider supporting the channel by using the links in the description. See you in the next episode.